and welcome back to Allen High School's discussion of acid-base chemistry at the APIB college level. Now we're in the midst of talking about conjugates and let's jump right into examples. Now this example gives us acids and requests the conjugate base. Now when you do that, you want to do what acids do best. Take off one H. It's one of the advantages of this unit is most of the work we're going to do is a one to one mole ratio. So we lose one H and one plus charge. So I'm going to have H2PO3 and it was neutral and I lost a plus so it's going to be negative. Now when I say possible salt, that's how am I going to get a negative ion into solution? And this might actually be called dihydrogen phosphite is the typical name. Um, there's a few other ways of naming it. But cheap salts use sodium and potassium as their cations. So in this case, it could be sodium dihydrogen phosphite would be the possible salt that we could add of that conjugate base. And you want to learn to recognize those salts. Remember, salts are a question of stoichiometry in terms of their behavior in mathematics. Now, HSO4. Remember, we only want to lose one H, and it only had one there, SO4. Now, it was negative. I lost another positive. All right, so if you want to write that here like this, and that's two negative. And the charges would balance on both sides. So plus one minus two is the minus one on the other side. So that's sulfate, and we could add, say, potassium sulfate to get that conjugate base into solution if we needed it uh, for some reason. Maybe, again, a buffer or a common ion. Oxalate is this, so this would be oxalic acid. We're only going to lose one of the H's to get its conjugate. It was neutral, you lose a plus and you have a leftover minus. Possible salt would be NaHC2O4. Okay. Now water, believe it or not, is something of an acid, not much of an acid but something of an acid. And we would get hydroxide would be the conjugate base there. And, and we're you know, not gonna talk about a salt of that because it's not really a salt anymore. So uh, that just really wasn't very appropriate. Let's do some acids. Remember, we want to do what bases do best. Well, what bases do best, and we're talking Bronsted-Lowry, that was in your inquiry is to gain an H and a plus charge. So let's do that for each of these. We're going to add an H and the plus. An H and the plus. And you get it, H and a plus. An H and a plus. Okay, so I'd have NH4 plus. Well, that's ammonium. Okay. So what, what about a possible salt? Well, we want some sort of cheap anion that doesn't interfere with too many things. And chloride is a good example, right? Because an acid base, HCl is strong, it doesn't stay as HCl, so chloride swims around in the pool and is probably not gonna do much, you know, unless maybe there's some silver ion lead to or mercury one hanging around. So to get some ammonium into the solution, we could add ammonium chloride would be a possible salt. Now, remember what we talked about. I said that our weak bases, most of them are going to be centered on an amine group, that nitrogen. So we're going to not take a look. We won't be looking at, see, I just about did it there, the carbons, because the carbons already have four bonds. Carbon cannot have more than four bonds. Instead, we zero in on that amine group. So instead of two hydrogens on the nitrogen, there are three, and I add my plus charge. And again, you know, maybe we could add, say, nitrate is usually a reasonable 
at anion that doesn't, wow, I think I've got a mistake here. Let me erase that and fix it because I know that'll mess with your minds. Sorry about that. That was a two. My mind was jumping ahead here. So CH3, CH2, NH3. Now another good salt or good anion there would be nitrate. So that would now be neutral. We could add it to the solution. Now we have H2SO4, and that's not an anion, that is an acid. And you know what, that's in theory, okay? So that really, in theory we could form that, but in practice that goes 100% that way. But it does demonstrate the principle for us. All right, now what I want us to look at is how the strengths of these vary as we compare acids and their conjugates. Because remember, structure determines function. And so if we want to understand both our acids and our bases together conceptually, I think this is a very important part of the conversation. I've heard some people say, if it's a strong acid, it has a weak conjugate. If it's a weak, weak acid, it has a strong conjugate. I think we have to be careful with that because we're looking at comparisons here. So let me take a look. The hydrochloric, there's my formula, its conjugate would be Cl minus. Now HCl is one of the strong acids that you're asked to memorize. In terms of a base, we're talking very, 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 very weak. We won't see it as in, in terms of any acid base properties at all. And so we wouldn't really even call it a, a base at that point because it has no acid base properties. Now, you may see it if you maybe ask for its conjugate, but the conjugate has really no base properties there at all. The same thing is true with nitric because nitrate is a very, very strong acid and strong acids don't have equilibrium constants. There's no Ka there. Remember, strong acids and strong bases, we're dealing with the mathematics of stoichiometry, not equilibria, okay? So nitrate has no base properties to speak of at all, okay? Now, iodic acid, HiO3, the conjugate would be IO3 minus, Okay. Now, this is a pretty big K. Right? What that means is, is that HiO3 is going to stay predominantly in this form. It's going to dissociate pretty darn close to 100%. Okay? So if you remember from our last unit, as we increase the Ka, we increase the amount of product that we form and in this case, we increase the strength of our acid. Now, we could say a similar thing about bases. As we increase Kb, we increase the products relative to reactants, because products are in the numerator, and that would increase the strength of our base. Okay, now if you'll notice then, now that I've gotten us started here on this chart, all right, let's get the arrow there. What we're doing here is increasing acid strength this way. Okay, now let's move on. We still are dealing with a relatively strong acid, that's oxalic acid, and um, so I would lose an H, and we'd have C2O4 minus would be the conjugate, and very, very, very weakly basic, right? And phosphorus acid, notice that it's always a one-to-one -one ratio here. We're just removing one H at a time. Phosphoric, you compared both of these in your inquiry. Um, formic, that's what makes those red ant bites that we sometimes get in the summer, especially here in Texas, Texas, that's what makes them sting so bad, okay? And I think you get the idea. Um, this is the methyl ammonium ion, and so it's trimethyl, there's three methyl, 
meth yl tells me it's a branch and then it'd be n right here would be the conjugate now if you evaluate their strengths you notice that the weaker the acid the stronger the conjugate that's what i want you to take home not weak versus strong but the relative if you're comparing strengths the stronger the acid the weaker its conjugate the weaker the acid the stronger its conjugate that's the relationship we're after here okay now in terms of our mathematics that we'll be dealing with you know what it's no different than our last unit and it, do you remember your acronym i hope you do or your teacher is going to cry remember doc saves everyone that acronym is still going to hold true it's equilibria uh, it's just a k-a-k-b a little variation on the theme and in fact i'd totally forgotten about a new acronym i came up with or a new framework for our stoichiometry and i'll show you that to see if you like it better okay so let's talk about a few more uh, terminology issues so polyprotic acids in amphoteric substances polyproduct means it has many protons it can give off so h2so4 is diprotic or considered polyprotic h3po4 is triprotic so we would call that a polyprotic now remember from your inquiry that looks triprotic but that's actually a diprotic so that's just terminology that tells me how many protons i have to throw out there into the water okay now amphoteric means that it's a substance that can act as an acid and or really a base depending on what else is present so it's kind of a bilingual substance uh, so to speak so if you look our amphoteric substances are often in the middle of a polyprotic step okay so let's take a look at this one since this one technically doesn't really go in reverse right because it's a stoichiometry it goes 100 percent the first h on that does now do you notice that in this direction h2po4 is acting as an acid in the reverse and excuse me a base because it's accepting i misspoke let's fix that sorry about that it's acting as a base in the reverse direction here right because in the reverse direction it's accepting an h and a plus and in this example in the forward it's donating an h and a plus and acting as an acid so those in between species of polyprotics are often amphoteric all right let me erase a little bit to clean it up so you can see what we're doing let's take a look at this this is an intermediary species in this direction it's acting as a base but down here we see the same thing the same substance acting as an acid now a common amphoteric is water so if i have two waters present one of them can donate an H plus to the other. So if this one loses an H and a plus, I have OH minus. If this one gains an H and a plus, I have H3O plus. So water is considered amphoteric. Okay, so that's some of the terminology involved. Now we're going to go on. Let me just walk through the framework for problem solving tools. Now we did stoichiometry. You can do stoichiometry using rice as long as you're realizing that E stands for end. Well, I came up with this. I don't know. I was doing some research and I totally forgot I did. That's a joy of having an elderly, blonde, distractible teacher. Another way to do this is you can set it up with this acronym. We're going to start. We're going to shift it and you shift until the limiting runs out and then we're going to stop it's not an equilibrium it's going to go a hundred percent until our limiting runs out 
And some of you may like using this SSS as opposed to using rice in, as both a stoichiometry and an equilibrium method. Okay, so uh, I totally forgot I came up with that last year. I think I saw something similar online. All right, now rice, you know how to do this. All right, the only thing I do is want to caution you on is the salts of conjugates and the stop values, the ending results of a stoichiometry, often give your initial conditions of an equilibrium. Your equilibrium aren't going to be these big, hairy, complicated reactions. Okay. Your change, again, just like in a stoichiometry, the change can uh, is going to use mole ratios. Okay. And then we have our equilibrium. Now, we saw a tiny glimpse of this. I didn't put it on the test, but you glimpsed it in some of the problems. If you're given pH and pOH, those are equilibrium values. Not initial, but equilibrium values. Okay? So, this is a summary of acronym world. Uh, whatever works to help you problem solve is what I want. So remember, DOC saves everyone. The D is dilution. If you add volume to volume, you have to voom voom. Okay, so if you uh, have a strong acid, a strong base, any acid or any base, and really we, you should know by now soluble salts fit in here as well, you got a stoichiometry, and we can use SSS method for that. Start. Shift, stop, okay? And E is for equilibrium, and we'll use rice. So stoichiometry goes 100%, and equilibrium is reversible, and goes somewhat less than that, all right? Now, that gives us, hopefully, our framework to start our discussion and our mathematics. You've got the concepts, I hope. Concepts are the hardest part of this test. Book notes would be the best thing you could do for this test. All right? Think about it. Until, see you later for some mathematics. This is signing off.